Sister Helen, thank you so much for speaking with me. In session four, we read a lot about the wealth and the racial inequalities that are rampant in the criminal justice system. Besides the objections to the death penalty in itself, what are the objections to the manner in which the penalty is applied and administered in this country? Well, if you look at what's happened in the 40 plus years of experience, what was the theory? We're only gonna save the death penalty for the worst of the worst murders. In practice, who got selected for the death penalty? Of the 1,500 people that have been executed and the 1,200 people on death row, you look and see who it's been, overwhelmingly 80%. People were chosen for death because they killed white people. If the lives of citizens are not highly valued, there's no outrage over their death. Race permeates it. And it's only poor people that are chosen for death. 98, 99%, all poor people. What difference does that make in the way it's applied? That means when you have a crackerjack attorney at your side, when you go to trial, then they know how to access your constitutional rights and protections for you. They also go up against the prosecutors seeking death. No prosecutor ever needs to seek death. They always have the option of not seeking death. So you got a crackerjack attorney by your side, then chances are you will never even be found guilty, much less get the death penalty. So it's been skewed from the start. The Supreme Court in the Greg v. Georgia decision that put death back said, oh, it's only going to be for the worst of the worst uh, murders, but we're going to leave the discretion up to the prosecutor to seek death or not. We just witnessed President Trump, because he had the discretionary power to kill, before he left office, he killed, he executed 13 human beings on federal death row, even though there had not been a death penalty carried out in 17 years. Why did he do it? Because he had the discretionary power to do it. And one of the fundamental things that the church that we have come to, and as Americans we're coming to, because we are shutting the death penalty down, we can't entrust those kind of decisions to execute or not, to go for death or not, in the hands of very fallible people. We have a way to keep our society safe without imitating the violence. And there's no way to make it work. There are now 182 wrongfully convicted people who have had the fortune, the luck, the grace to get out from under, in, in on death row like for 20, 30 years, made a mistake, made another mistake. For every eight people that have been executed in this country, one has had to been, have to be released because they made another mistake. What should be the legitimate purposes of incarceration of convicted offenders? First of all, when we look at other countries other than the United States, it's shocking to see the alternatives that other nations are putting in, in play. Instead of throwing people away behind walls and, and putting in, in them in cages for almost the rest of their life or a good part of their life. What is really served by that? When you have a population that's made to be very afraid of people, what people say is throw them away, throw them away, get them out, throw away the key. And boy, was that ever rampant all throughout, beginning in the 70s and the 80s, to just exile people. And the underlying conviction of it too was, if you have caused pain on others, we ought to cause you some pain. We're gonna put you in prison and it's not gonna be a nice place. You know, you're never gonna have agency in your life. You're never gonna have freedom. You're always gonna be subject to violence and rape within prison. You're always gonna have terrible food. You can always be in crowded condition. We want you to suffer. And that is not a God. And that is not of Christ. Because what we want to do is restore life, not to just impose pain, extra pain on people. And Restorative justice is going to be the road of the future. Here's the thing I've discovered with all the people that I've met in prison, 90%, most of them came from childhoods of neglect, abuse, violence, and then they acted out the violence on someone else, and then we imposed further pain on them for the rest of their lives. The road out the road forward, the road of life is not one of pain, but one of restoring life. 
they have made tremendous discoveries in all these years of incarceration, those that are calling for the end of massive incarceration. If you do the least bit of education of people in prison, their lives are not the same when they leave. The least bit of it. We are so used to being educated out at Bloom and Kazoo because we get so much education. But what education does for human beings is it gives them a sense of themselves. It gives them a sense, hey, I can read and understand that. I can make out reality. I don't have to use violence. I knew this guy in prison, Bobby Leonard, classy. All he ever did, whenever he got in any trouble, got in an argument, he was just in there with his fist. Violence was the only thing. Well, I'll shut you up. That's the end of our argument, because it's all he knew. He didn't know how to read, and he didn't know how to think his way through. He didn't know how to talk. He didn't know how to express himself. He was in a federal prison in Atlanta. He learned how to read. He learned how to write. And he even went into you know gr group support where he could learn to speak. And he goes, here's a great discovery. Hey. I don't have to hit them first. I mean, the first thing we can do is talk it through and, and manage your way in life is it cut down the violence tremendously. Most people, I think the average educational age of people in our Louisiana state pr prison, which is the largest incarcerator in the United States, um, is sixth or seventh grade level. They never got any further. There are no great educational programs in prisons. So that's going to be the road. And then you have retreats that happen in prison. When you have a retreat, they call the Kairos retreats. And people in prison who get a thousand signals a day from the guards and everybody that they're nothing but disposable human waste. And you have a community around you and you're praying together and you're sharing together. Then you become brothers or sisters together. And you have a sense, I'm not just a bunch of trash. I'm a human being, and that sense of community retreats and spiritual programs and prisons do a whole lot to helping people understand how that they are a son of God, a daughter of God. Thank you so much, Sister Prejean.